let's welcome everyone to this week's Citizens Climate University. We're so glad that you've joined us and it's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics related to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and tonight we're gonna to join Dana Nucitelli, CCL's research coordinator, for a training that reviews the need for approaches to remove and sequester carbon from the atmosphere. It'll also examine the role trees and forests can play and the other benefits that those solutions provide. And this training is gonna provide a background on the need for carbon sequestration, how much carbon sequestration is needed, and how forests can provide it as well as other tree benefits and the importance of tree equity. So to take us through tonight's training, we're gonna have the wonderful guest speaker, Dana Nucitelli. A little bit more about Dana. Dana is an environmental scientist and climate journalist by trade with a master's degree in physics. And Dana's written about climate change since 2010. If you're familiar with the website, Skeptical Science, he was a frequent contributor there and happy to talk more about that in Q&A as well. And now Dana serves as CCL's research coordinator. He's been on staff for a year after nine years as a volunteer with the Sacramento chapter. He loves giving presentations. He's given dozens of them around the country, especially in California, about the climate change impacts like wildfires and droughts that I know many of us are facing and policy solutions like carbon fee and dividend. And now our focus as well on tree and natural uh, nature-based policies. So with that, Dana, I will pass it to you to review our agenda and the show is yours. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Cool, thanks, Brett. So uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about some forests and some trees, um, which is going to be one of CCL's uh, additional policy objectives. Before we dive into it, I wanted to give a big overview of where we're at in that process of identifying our specific future policy objectives. So, you know, right now everybody's focus is of course on budget reconciliation and trying to get some climate investments hopefully, fingers crossed, passed you know, through that process in the next uh, few weeks. Um, and then, so we're focused on that for the time being. And then after that, we've got the November election. So, you know, we're hoping that a lot of folks will engage with Environmental Voter Project and, you know, local candidates and do forums and talk about climate change and things like that. So that's kind of the focus for the rest of the year. And during that time, uh, we on the CCL staff are going to be able to identify the specifics and nail down the specifics of these future policy objectives that we are doing in addition to carbon fee and dividend. So we expect to be rolling out more details on these policies coming into the next year. Um, so you guys don't have to worry about it too much, although we're gonna try to give some background on the forests and trees tonight, of course, but are we expect the main focus of volunteers to be on reconciliation and the elections for pretty much the rest of the year as we figure out these details. But let's nevertheless talk about some forests and why we are starting with natural climate solutions, starting with forests. And so we had sort of a long list of criteria that we ran all potential uh, policies that we could identify by talking with a bunch of experts, reading all the literature. We're trying to figure out what would be a good fit for CCL's advocacy. So, you know, a big one, of course, is that we need any additional policy that we're going to add to our quiver to achieve significant greenhouse gas reductions. So that's very important, of course. We want to be effective in our advocacy and forests do kind of check that box. They're not like huge, but they do achieve, they could potentially achieve significant reductions in greenhouse gases. And I'll go into some more details on that later in this talk. Uh, they can also both do mitigation by taking carbon out of the atmosphere and help with adaptation by doing things like uh, providing cooling services, uh, shading and things like that that we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, so lots of co-benefits in terms of both, you know, they have cooling benefits uh, in cities and things like that. They also can provide air quality improvements. We'll talk about that. So lots of different co-benefits. Uh, there's also lots of different potential coalition partners. Like we've been talking a lot with American Forests. They, you know, American Forest folks were on our national call a couple months ago because uh, they have a lot of expertise already in this area. So there's lots of partners that we can talk to and you know discuss with and identify the best policies out there and, and take advantage of their expertise. So that's a nice benefit there. And then of course it has forests have bipartisan supports um, because you know frankly everybody loves trees. And actually that's a topic that I have researched extensively and I think I can prove it. 
um, because I think any lover of great literature will agree that the individual who is least likely to love trees is the Grinch. Um, and that's, of course, because as we know, the Grinch's heart was two sizes too small. And so nevertheless, all available uh, uh, visual evidence indicates that the Grinch uh, loves trees as well. And so ipso facto, I think that proves that everybody loves trees. So uh, getting serious with some numbers here. To kind of put the scale of the problem and the potential solution into focus. Uh, so humans have added about 300 billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere so far, a whole lot of carbon, but Earth's plants and soils store about 3 trillion tons of carbon combined. So you can kind of picture like if we got these 3 trillion tons, we can just boost that a bit uh, with some improved natural solutions and we can take a big chunk out of that uh, 300 billion tons of carbon that are in the atmosphere if we can do you know, some policies to help boost that natural carbon storage. So there's a lot of potential there. So that's kind of a starting point. Um, and then just to kind of picture uh, how natural sinks work, or natural solutions work, uh, I like to use this bathtub analogy. So you can think of the atmosphere as like a bathtub, and the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are the water in the bathtub. Uh, you can think of right now the water is starting to spill over the sides of the bathtub as, you know, we got a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, a lot of warming, so it's starting to do a lot of damage to the floor of the bathroom, and so how do we solve that problem? Well, first we need to turn off the faucet, turn it down and turn it off as quickly as possible, which is the equivalent of that is reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. But also you can you know, unplug the drain and let the water come out of the drain. And that's the equivalent of what natural carbon sinks do. It's you know pulling that water out of the tub or pulling the carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, so it's something you have to do both at the same time. Like you can't just open the drain. You can't just turn off the faucet because the water is already overflowing. And so you need to do both at the same time as quickly as you possibly can. You can't just do one or the other. And so that's one critique that people often have uh, when you start to talk about natural carbon sinks. Let's say we're distracting from our need to reduce emissions. And so we definitely don't want it to be a distraction. We need to make it clear that we need to do both of these things as quickly as we can and as much as we can. So we have to maximize both the carbon sinks and the reducing carbon emissions. But both are important. So right now in the United States, uh, our natural sinks remove about close to 800 million tons of carbon dioxide per year, which is about 12% of uh, US annual emissions. So a nice chunk. Our emissions are being taken care of for us by these natural uh, carbon sinks, these natural, these natural sources. Uh, that has been pretty steady over the past 15 to 20 years or so. Um, it hasn't gone up or down very much. It's just been pretty flat. Most of that, about 95%, is from trees and forests. So you can see I put this chart on here, on the right side here, from uh, data from the EPA. So 82% is from forests, 13% is from urban trees, which is I was surprised it was that big. We got a lot of urban tree growth. And then a little bit of chunk from grasslands and agriculture. Um, these all have the potential to be boosted quite a bit if we implement policies that would encourage uh, activities that would increase the carbon storage and carbon removal uh, by these different categories. But right now, uh, forests and urban trees are already doing a whole lot of work. So it kind of makes sense. They're already doing a lot of carbon removal. So it's a good place to kind of focus first and try to boost what they're already doing. In terms of the size we need, uh, roughly speaking, a good ballpark is estimate is that we need to remove about 10 billion tons, 10, 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year by the year 2050. And there's a few uh, different reasons for that based on different time scales. So in the short term, we need to get, our emissions are going up. We need to get those to peak and start going down. And so, you know, the quicker you can do that, the better. And so that happens more quickly if you can start to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. So in the short term, we're trying to get emissions to peak. In the kind of middle term, uh, we're trying to offset not what we call hard to abate emissions because we're trying to get to net zero emissions by somewhere around middle of the century. And the problem is there are a bunch of industries like agriculture or a bunch of sectors like agriculture, industry, and long distance transport that have um, emissions that are, we call them hard to abate because they're either very expensive to replace uh, with clean sources or like we just don't necessarily have the technology to do it yet. And so because those are gonna be very difficult to abate, 
Uh, we anticipate that we're not going to be able to get to net to totally zero emissions in those sectors by 2050. And so if you want to get to net zero emissions, that means you have to pull the same amount of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as those sectors are adding, you know, around 2050 or so. And so that's just like, if you want to get to net zero, you need to do some kind of carbon dioxide removal. And so that's why the IPCC described in its latest report just a couple months ago, uh, described carbon dioxide removal as unavoidable and essential because you can't get to net zero without it. And then in the very long term, we actually want to probably draw down the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and reduce global temperatures because we're getting into this really dangerous, you know, high warming, high climate change level where we're going, you know, we're already at beyond one degree Celsius, we're heading beyond 1.5, we're trying to limit to less than two. That's already like getting higher than we want it to be. So in the long term, we want to actually reduce it. Um, and so if you want to reduce uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and reduce global temperatures, then you're, of course, you're going to have to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And so that's in the long term, another reason why you need to do carbon dioxide removal. So there's been a few different studies trying to figure out like at a cost effective number, which is they put it about $100 per ton, they consider as cost effective. At that price point, like how much, car how much carbon could natural solutions pull out of the atmosphere? And there's pretty good agreement that globally, you could buy about the year 2050, you could get about 10 billion tons, 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year, which co it's conveniently it matches about what we need to do um, and to get to basically get to net zero, roughly speaking. That is like maximum, like if we can like totally maximize all of our natural solutions, which realistically won't, won't be able to do, but at least it's in the ballpark of what we need to do to get to net zero and offset those hard to abate emissions. So that's encouraging. Um, it's a relatively small uh, temperature change. Like if you could do that, you would get about uh, 0.3 degrees Celsius co uh, like cooling effect. Um, so I think if you're going to like two degrees Celsius, you can offset 0.3. So you're getting a nice little chunk. It's not like huge, it's not the only thing you need, but it is a nice little chunk of both emissions and temperature reduction. Um, so again, it's like not the only thing, but it is one significant um, effect on emissions and temperatures. And specifically in the United States, uh, we are very fortunate. We have a big country. We have a lot of forests. We have a lot of uh, potential natural solutions. So actually 10, about 10% 10 of the global potential uh, is the potential in the United States. We could get close to one gigaton of carbon dioxide removal per year just in the United States. So it's a nice potential solution specifically for us in the US because of our you know, large land area and large natural solution potential. Uh, of that potential 1 billion tons in the United States, about 20 to 50% of that uh, is going to potentially come from forests, uh, depending on how effective we are at implementing the policies that we need to do. But again, that's a nice big chunk that could come from forests. The rest is like from, the potential is from like agriculture and sp like specific things like biochar that I'm not gonna go into. Um, but a big chunk of it is from potentially from forests. And there are, of course, a lot of challenges that we're going to talk about a bit. Um, one is we call it permanence, because like you can pull a bunch of carbon out of the atmosphere into trees that are growing, but then if those trees burn a wildfire, the carbon goes back into the atmosphere, or the trees can get killed by various stressors like bark beetles and heat stress and drought stress and water stress, things like that. So yeah, like it's nice for the carbon to be pulled out of the atmosphere, but you need to actually stay in those trees and in those wood uh, products. So there is a challenge with the fact that, especially in the Western United States where I am, climate change is uh, putting a lot of stress and threatening a lot of trees. So that's something we have to consider in our uh, search for smart climate, climate forestry policies too. Okay, so this is a chart, it's a complicated one, but I'll try to explain it and then I'm gonna try to simplify it. This is from a paper that was just recently published where, which was looking at what it will take for the U.S. to meet our 2030 Paris commitments uh, between now and 2030. Like we have a long ways to go. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit here. So the circles we're looking at are net emissions. The left bar here is 2005. The second one is 2019. Uh, the bars show the emissions for every sector. And then the blue is actually uh, the emissions that are the greenhouse gases that are pulled out of the atmosphere every year by American uh, natural land sources, land sinks. So that's why the circle is a bit above, below the uh, top of the bar, because it's accounting for the amount of carbon being pulled out of the atmosphere by our natural sinks. So, 
So in 2005, we had about 6.6 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions in the United States. And so our Paris target is to get to 50% below uh, that level by 2030. So by 2030, we want to get to 3.3 billion tons. So that's this line right here. And then these seven bars are seven different or energy modeling scenarios looking at different ways uh, that we could get to that target by 2030, like what it would take from different sectors to meet that target. So you can see that's why all these circles are right around this line, because they're looking at scenarios that meet that 50% by 2030 target. And then you can see right here in 2019, we are quite a ways short. So we need to get really big cuts in the next eight years to make that happen. Um, but one thing that's worth pointing out is that the land sinks are really important to make this happen. So right now, as I mentioned, we're close to 800 uh, million tons of carbon dioxide removed by U.S. Uh, land sinks every year. And roughly speaking, uh, these scenarios agree that if we're going to meet our Paris target, we have to boost that by about 25% to get that from close to 800 million tons to one gigaton, which, uh, yeah, it's one gigaton per year. So yeah, they all pretty much agree that in boosting land sinks, uh, especially forests, is going to be really important if the US is going to meet our Paris target. So I try to put this in a little bit simpler terms, just in a nice simple pie chart, looking at how much each sector needs to contribute to these emissions reductions between now and 2030 if we're going to meet our Paris commitments. So you can see the big one is electricity. So they, uh, according to these model scenarios, we have to really boost our solar and wind energy a whole lot over the next eight years. The second biggest one is transportation. So we need to start uh, getting a lot more people to buy EVs for the most part um, to really reduce our transportation emissions. We've got other greenhouse gases, which is mostly like methane and hydrofluorocarbons, uh, which are very potent greenhouse gases that we're doing, actually making some good progress in phasing those out. And so that's promising. And then we get this big chunk, 8% from natural land sinks. So again, like the, our forestry and land sinks are not the only thing we need. Uh, we need a lot of other stuff, a lot of other policies to meet our targets, but they are a nice big chunk and we're gonna have a hard time meeting our Paris targets without that chunk from land sinks. So somebody's gotta make that happen policy-wise and that's why we think CCL is in a good position to make, help make that happen. And then 5% also is from buildings, uh, making buildings more efficient, doing things like insulation and replacing fossil fuel heating with electric heat pumps and stuff like that. So um, yeah, a lot of stuff we got to do, but one big chunk of that does need to come from land sinks, especially from forests, because forests are already doing most of our natural carbon move. So how do we make that happen and uh, why are forests important? Um, so forests are the largest uh, carbon sink on earth on land right now in the continental United States. That's what Colin says. The continental United States, there's over a trillion trees right now. It's nearly one third of the large U.S. land area is forested, which is why trees are doing such uh, big work removing carbon dioxide for us. As I mentioned, they, those forests sequester about 12% of our, our emissions. 73% uh, of that is from private working forests, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And if you also include wood products, it's about 15 to 16% of our emissions are offset by trees and wood products. So it's a big chunk. Uh, research has suggested that we could boost that annual sequestration from forests by about 20% if we fully stock all understocked productive forest land, which is like forest land where uh, a lot of trees have been harvested, or maybe there's been some deaths from uh, wildfires or bark beetles or things like that. So it's like areas where we could plant more trees um, and try to plant them in a way that they would grow safely. Um, if we could do that uh, effectively, then we could get another, so that would boost our emissions, uh, or cut or uh, boost the amount of carbon pulling pull out of the atmosphere to enough to offset 3% of US annual emissions. So nice little chunk. And then you get a similar potential size if you improve US forest management policies and practices. Uh, with so us doing things like uh, harvesting trees once they're older, so letting them grow longer and pull more carbon out of the atmosphere during their life cycle. Um, so waiting till they get old before you harvest them. And then also logging in a way that has less impact on the surrounding trees and surrounding forests um, so that they are less impacted and more effective at pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. 
So yeah, I mentioned private working forests. So we can, we kind of categorize forests in a few different ways. There's privately owned, there's publicly owned, and then there's working and non-working. And so working is if the forest is being harvested for wood products and obviously not working as if it's not being harvested for wood products. And the biggest chunk, almost half of the forest land in the United States is private working forests. And then the rest of it is kind of split up between private non-working, public working and private and uh, public non-working. So the big difference uh, is that non-working forests, they have a lot of like old growth trees that aren't growing very much, but they are very large. And so it's when a tree is growing that is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and it's when a tree is large that it, it, it kind of stores a lot of carbon because it's got a lot of wood. And so non-working forests store more carbon, but they don't pull as much carbon out of the atmosphere. They don't sequester as much carbon because they're not growing very much. Whereas working forests, you know, you're harvesting trees and then planting new ones and new ones are growing. And so working forests are the ones that are pulling more carbon out of the atmosphere but they're not sequestering as much carbon because you don't have as many old trees. And so you can kind of see that on this chart here. So if you look on the left at the private working, again, that's almost half of our forest land. And you got a pretty even split of a very large amount of carbon being pulled out of the atmosphere every year by the growing trees. And also there is a fair amount of older trees that are still there that are storing a bunch of carbon. Uh, then public working is kind of similar, but um, there's less harvesting going on. So there is still uh, quite a bit of carbon being pulled out, pulled out, out of the atmosphere by growing trees, but not as much because there's not as much harvesting going on. And then if you look at the non-working forests, there's not a whole lot of new growth. And so they don't have a lot of carbon being pulled out of the atmosphere, but they are storing a whole lot of carbon because they have a lot of old growth trees. And so policy-wise, you kind of want to do both things. You want to conserve and preserve the old growth forests while also doing a lot of planting of new trees um, so that those new trees can grow and pull more carbon out of the atmosphere. So you kind of have to do both things and keep both things in mind in your policy development. And then uh, I mentioned before, there is also wood, which stores carbon. Um, there's this really nice product called crass laminated timber, which is when you kind of lay uh, the wood slats in opposite directions in this um, stacking uh, material. And then it's really good for building large buildings. Um, so it can actually potentially replace a lot of concrete and steel construction of, of large buildings, which is really good because concrete and steel have pretty large carbon footprints. So if you can replace a lot of that with this cross laminated timber, then you can reduce the carbon footprints of the building. And also you're storing the carbon that was in the tree. Now it's in the wood and that wood material stays in that building for a long time. And so you get a lot of this carbon storage uh, for a long period of time just in the material itself. And so it's like a very low carbon and car good carbon storage way of doing buildings. Um, and so there's like a good push among architects to use this material a lot more. Uh, it's also kind of aesthetically pleasing. It looks really cool. Um, and it's also uh, fire resistant and earthquake resistant. So it's just really good building material too. So there are a lot of benefits to this cross laminated timber. And then there's also uh, this cool company in, I believe it's in Sweden, making wooden wind turbines, which is kind of a new thing, uh, which they're doing with like, they make these uh, thin veneers and then they kind of stack them up to make the wall of the, the base of the wind turbine, uh, which has a lot of benefits because it's like, easier to transport one for one thing because a wind turbine like normally if you make it out of steel you have to transport this big base of the, this huge wind turbine uh, over long distances across roads and there are limitations about how big it can be to like fit on a truck and fit on a road and so you're constrained uh, by the size there whereas if you're just trans tra transporting these lighter and like thinner uh, veneers that you can then kind of glue together on site it, it makes it a lot easier to transport so you can make potentially bigger wind, wind turbines uh, again, they also have much lower carbon footprint because instead of using relatively high carbon uh, content steel, you're using wood, which is lower carbon uh, footprint, and it's storing the carbon in the wood. Um, it's as strong as steel, but 30% lighter for the same strength. So it's actually lighter weight. It lasts just as long. It's fire resistant. So it's actually a really good material. Um, it probably needs some work to be as cost effective as using steel, but there are a lot of these kind of environmental and uh, structural benefits of using wind, wood and wind turbines. So hopefully at some point that'll kind of catch on. Um, we also hear, 
you know, you often often hear critiques that like wind turbines, they're not zero carbon because, you know, you have to build them out of steel and you have to transport the steel and there's all these, you know, uh, carbon, uh, carbon uh, emissions uh, associated with the kind of manufacturing and transport and installation of the wind turbines, which, you know, over the lifetime of wind turbine is pretty insignificant, but if you can make the wind turbine out of wood, then you can address those kind of bad faith arguments at the same time. So um, there are, of course, a lot of challenges and also a lot of opportunities when it comes to forestry policy. So this is a nice map from a paper published a few years ago, uh, looking at the, the way that forests are disturbed, uh, the map the most, mostly disturbed in different regions of the country. So there's a lot of blue here, which means that most of the forest disturbance is coming from harvesting of trees. Uh, red is if you're getting, seeing a lot of wildfires, and green is if you're seeing a lot of bark beetles. And so you can see the impacts are very different in the western half of the United States where I live. We have a lot of uh, bark beetle outbreaks, killing a lot of trees, and of course a lot of wildfires, uh, also killing a lot of trees. Whereas on, in the eastern half of the country where you're not experiencing these severe droughts, and other climate change impacts uh, that we're seeing in the West, uh, that's less of a problem. And so there's a lot of opportunities to, you know, since there's a lot of private forests and a lot of harvesting of trees, especially in kind of the South and also the South, the Northeast and the North part of the country, there's a lot of policy opportunities there to plant more trees, do it in a sustainable way, grow a lot of trees, and then increase the amount of carbon being pulled out of the atmosphere through natural solutions, especially in those regions. Also in the Pacific Northwest, uh, where it's a little wetter and cooler, and so has less of a problem with uh, fires and bark beetle outbreaks. But then we're talking about forestry policy in places like California. You do have to bear in mind that we have very different climate and weather conditions. And so any forestry policy has to be very uh, focused on like where are you implementing those policy solutions, because your policy solutions in California are going to be very different from the southern states, for example. So it's something we have to be cognizant of, but there are solutions that are effective even for forests in California that will help with our wildfire problem. Um, so, and there's, of course, always the pitfalls that you don't want to encourage things accidentally in any policy you support, like clear cutting of forests, um, there's also often a problem of planting monoculture trees. So you're planting the same kind of tree. That's basically the idea is that it's fast growing. And so if you're a timber company, that will grow fast and you can harvest it really quickly, relatively speaking, and get more timber, but it may not be very well suited, that particular species for the region that you're growing it in. And I also ideally you want to have a diversity of tree species that you're growing because that's better for the biodiversity of the local ecosystem. And so you don't want to encourage uh, monoculture tree planting. Uh, there's also the question of what happens to the wood product once the tree is harvested. Um, there is this big issue of wood pellets being burned for energy, uh, especially in Europe. And if that happens, then all the carbon that was in the tree is now getting put right back up to the atmosphere, which is not so good if what you're trying to do is keep carbon out of the atmosphere. And so you want to try not to encourage that kind of activity. In your policy, ideally, you want to use any harvested wood for things like glass laminated timber and other wood products that will more permanently store the carbon. And then, as I mentioned in the West, we have to worry about wildfires. So there's a lot of things that we can do there, like you know, trying to do prescribed burns and things like that. I think I've got a slide on that, so I'm not going to get ahead of myself too much. Um, then there are other tree benefits aside from climate benefits. Um, so for one thing, as I mentioned, if you're conserving and restoring depleted forests, that helps protect the biodiversity of that forest ecosystem, which is very important. Uh, yeah, in the West, I mentioned the climate smart forestry practices to lessen wildfires So things like if you're going to try to replant a forest, uh, now that conditions are becoming drier and drier and drier and hotter and hotter, and you're worried more and more about um, wildfire conditions, then you want to start plant the trees further spaced apart. So they're not competing as much for the same water. Now there's less water available. Um, so doing things like that to keep the, the changing climate in mind in your uh, reforestation planning activities. Uh, thinning dense forests, removing dead trees so that there's less fuel for wildfires. Uh, prescribed burns are very important to, again, thin out the amount of wildfire fuel that's available so that wildfires, when they do happen, aren't as intense. 
And then especially in cities, trees provide lots of good services, like they improve air quality by kind of the leaves kind of filter the uh, pollutants in the air. And so they, especially in cities, they improve air quality. They also provide cooling by you know, putting moisture in the air and providing shading. So very important, especially in cities, because cities have a lot of asphalt and concrete and materials that kind of radiate heat. And so you get this urban heating effect. At the same time, we're getting more heat waves. And so we're getting a lot of uh, really high uh, heat events uh, and heat waves and danger from heat stress and things like that in cities. And so trees and green spaces are very important to plant to alleviate that worsening uh, heat threat. And that raises the issue of tree equity that our friends at American Forest talk to us about. Uh, but briefly, we have this issue that uh, in the United States, communities, communities of color have 33% less tree canopy than predominantly white neighborhoods, and poor communities have 41% less tree canopy than wealthy neighborhoods. So that's our tree, tree equity problem, that these poor and uh, disadvantaged communities um, don't have the trees available to create these benefits of better air quality and cooling services that they're going to need, especially since for one thing, they tend to be located closer to pollution sources. So those are the places where you want to have more trees filtering the air pollutants out of the air. And of course, they're going to face the same heat wave problems. And there was actually a good recent study about this that looked at 35 US metropolitan areas and estimated that had uh, we planted more trees and more green spaces over the past 20 years, in those 35 uh, US metropolitan areas, we would have saved about or prevented about 36,000 premature deaths um, from heat and air pollution. So that's a really good thing to do from not just from a climate perspective, but also from a health perspective and from a becoming more resilient to climate change impacts perspective. So policy-wise, there's a lot of different things that we can do with forestry policies. We can expand uh, protected areas to kind of preserve uh, more forests and conserve forests. Uh, we can do forest resource management uh, to address invasive species like bark beetles, um, do, uh, as I talked about, uh, measures to reduce wildfire risks, um, use, uh, encourage the increased use of timber as a building material to displace the concrete and steel and store that carbon in the wood products, uh, reforestations, again, to uh, increase the number of trees in areas that have been depleted by various, uh, by various reasons. And urban tree planting, we just talked about uh, to especially alleviate that problem of tree equity uh, and uh, address the problems of air pollution and heat waves that are going to be worsened by climate change. So specifically uh, in last November, the house passed Build Back Better. Uh, which had lots of money for forest research and protection and restoration and recovery and carbon management. Uh, that, of course, uh, is being stalled in the Senate. Uh, as we speak, it's being negotiated. So it will remain to be seen if uh, any of that funding remains in what, fingers crossed, will eventually be passed in the next few weeks uh, and through, through the budget reconciliation process. So that remains to be seen. But at least that's what the House did in its version. Uh, the Biden administration has its America the Beautiful, Beautiful campaign, which aims to preserve 30% of U.S. land, including forests, by 2030, so good conservation there. There's also a bunch of bipartisan forestry bills. Uh, so Joe Manchin's actually got one called the America's Revegetation and Carbon Sequestration Act, which does quite a few different things, including revegetation, reforestation, uh, things like that, keeping in mind these carbon sequestration of growing forests. So that's actually got some good stuff in it and it's bipartisan. There is the Rural Forest Markets Act, uh, which tries to improve those private forest management practices that we talked about, uh, the harvesting and replanting of trees. Uh, there is the Forest Act, which is uh, one of our secondary asks that addresses uh, illegally, illegally deforested land and says we're not going to buy products imported from illegally deforested land in other countries. Uh, there is the Replant Act, which actually passed in the bipartisan infrastructure bill last year, which provides the United States uh, Forest Service with funds for reforestation. So that's really important and really good to see that that passed on a bipartisan vote. So again, good evidence that there is bipartisan support for these forest and tree solutions. Uh, there's also the Trees Act, which uh, and it provides funding for residential tree planting. Again, 
uh, very important, uh, especially if you can do it in ways that address tree inequities. Uh, and then there's the Save Our Sequoias bill that I think there are efforts to press that this year, which is uh, directed very specifically at protecting sequoias, big trees in California. Um, but that has a lot of bipartisan support, especially among members of Congress from California. And then there is the Farm Bill, which is going to be up for renewal next year. That's one of your like must pass packages and it has forestry stuff in it. So that's just kind of a nice venue. Uh, through which forestry policies could be kind of lumped in and passed in a big package. So that's something to keep in mind that that's happening in the next year or so. So uh, that's pretty much the end. And I just wanted to kind of close by re-emphasizing that we have a lot of bipartisan and coalition opportunities through these uh, tree and forest policies. Because um, of course, you know, our lefty tree huggers, of course, love trees. Our moderate centrists, they love trees. And as we have established, even the Grinch loves trees. So there's a lot of opportunities. Everybody loves trees. Uh, a lot of opportunities to get things done in this space. So I will stop there. Excellent. Thanks so much, Dana, for all of you. If you do have questions that we didn't get to or that you think of after tonight, I put a link in the chat where you can find our forums. It's just cclusa.org forward slash forums. Please email me any specific feedback. Again, if you had any thoughts to ways to improve this for future renditions. And please join me as we are at the end for giving a huge round of applause to Dana. Thank you so much, Dana, for all the preparation, the research, the time that you've put in really to walking us through. This is a big scoped area. And I think you did a really good job tonight really walking us through a bunch of the different areas and considerations as we expand our focus. Um, so I'm going to unmute a line so we can hear each other as we wave each other off tonight. We hope that you are well. Stay safe, everyone. And thank you again for all of your support. Good to see you. Thanks for thank coming, everybody. Bye, thank, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank, you. Thank, you. Dana. All right. thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.